Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Pints with Air. I'm Brent Hefley, Sales and Marketing Director. I'm here with uh, Ariel Brown, our VP and Senior Engineer, and Ryan Berry, our CEO and Expert Technician. As always, uh, we're excited to have you here for another episode and another beer. So what did you guys pull out of the, uh, the cellar today there, Ariel? Uh, so I found here at one of our monthly shopping trips at Costco, we found they had Hackershore, the Oktoberfest, Martson. So nice. uh, I picked up a case of that and it is delicious. <laughs> Keeping our German tour going. You're making, yeah. you're making me want to go Probably to the Munich one. show. I, I want to go to the Munich show already. And it's, I got to say, you know, I, I, you I, move I, it. I obviously really love the, the Munich show, but I've had, I think I've had more German beer varieties <laughs> doing this than I had going to Munich. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, maybe, maybe if we can't go to Munich this year, depending on what happens, we'll just have a dedicated episode to Munich, Munich beers, like just Munich beers. As long as we get pretzels and Wiener schnitzel. <laughs> All right, it's, it's a deal. <clears throat> Easily arranged. It is a deal. Nice. Well, I went local. I broke out of the uh, Oktoberfest phase, and this was, I, I have to admit it again, this was a total label purchase when I first uh, first got this. This is the Sasquatch nice. Wood Boy IPA from Portland, Oregon. Um, and, you know, sometimes you get the label and the beer's not so great. This is a good beer. It's a good, it's like, good IPA. It's this beautiful amber color. It's a little caramely, but nice, uh, nice hop blend. So, oh yeah, we should show the picture uh, of the the German beer too. So it's a nice one. Oh, nice. In the Cardis, Cardis mug. Yeah, the Cardis beer. glass. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I like that. <laughs> I dug that one out of my basement, literally. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean he means we use them all the time, and we really appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> oh yes, but <laughs> yeah. Well, the basement's your basement pub is what you meant, right? Like the yeah. basement pub. Yeah. <laughs> uh, excellent. Well, cheers. Cheers, everyone out there listening to, watching this, watching this video. Ironically, I'm actually wearing my Cardis socks right now, too. So oh, we nice. have all kinds of Cardis gear on. <laughs> I mean, what else do you need? Socks and a, and a pint glass. Yeah, we're not using, but we're not using their, their uh, discs as, as coasters, just like mm. it says. I'm using one <laughs> one. I've got, I've got one here. Yeah, yeah there you right. go. <laughs> it says not a coaster. <laughs> not a coaster. Wink, wink, not, not. Yeah. <laughs> uh, excellent. Well, today I think we're going to talk about um, chassis and chassis design. Um, you know, it's it's interesting because when you look around our industry, there are like there's such a variety of aesthetic designs and chassis, which are great. Like there's some beautiful stuff out there, some very pra pragmatic, plain stuff timeless, you know, different finishes. Um, and some of it is purely aesthetic. Others have an effect on the sound. Um, it's not easy to design them or manufacture them at, as, uh, you know, uh, even though it appears like they're a fairly simple thing, there's a lot that goes into them. Um, Ryan, you've been doing a lot of our drawings lately and working on that stuff. Ariel's working on the the aspect of how we fit everything into it where it all goes so it's you know if you're off of it by a ten thousandth of an inch sometimes you're in big, oh, yeah. big trouble yep yep <laughs> so what, is huge <laughs> yeah so what what uh what would we say is the the most i don't know interesting or difficult part of actually doing a design of a chassis for a product well, I mean, the thing with the chassis, like you said, and I think that's a really key point, is that there's more than there's there's multiple things that a chassis is accomplishing. There's the there's the aesthetic aspect of it. You know, there's there's the buy-in. Nobody wants to buy a product for the amount of money that many of the high-end audio pieces cost, and then have something that looks like it could have come off of you know, out of some generic box right. that should have cost a hundred dollars. So there's the aesthetic part of it, but you know, in the, in the end of the day, 99% of us are huge audiophile guys and the sound is where it's really key. And so those, those two things actually have to be considered at, the, at the same time. And then there's just so many real world use issues that you need to think about at the same time. For example, um, you know, I've been largely involved with doing the chassis since the QX5 here at Air. 
Mm -hmm. And uh, when I was working at the QX5, you know, where you look at things like the little scallops that go around the, um, the knobs and everything, the, 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 the cuts there, and uh, I had everything carved out in, in SolidWorks, it looks perfect. And, uh, you know, all the corners are perfectly square and everything's gorgeous. And the first thing Charlie did when he saw it was like, oh, well, we can't do 90 degree corners. And I said, well, why not? And he goes, well, when they do the brush finish across it, that will pull sharp edges. And therefore, we have to always have less than 90 degree corners. So, you know, you'll never be able to tell on things like this, but like little details like that, you know, all of the all of the, the beveled edges we have to bring out ever so slightly to make them slightly less than 90 degrees to make sure that, you know, when they do the brush finish, it's still gonna be smooth and it doesn't cut anybody. And little things like that, um, that all kind of play a factor into the thing. Uh, another thing that we always do is, you know, the aesthetic pleasing portion of it. Um, we know it's kind of funny, but you know, Charlie's always was a big believer in the golden ratio. Mm -hmm. So everything on a, all of our devices has some kind of tie into the golden ratio, whether it be the spacing between the knobs or whatnot. We take that number and we, we multiply it or, or manipulate it in some way effectively to, to get it close to where we want to. But, you know, we're never, we, we always try to like follow that golden aspect ratio on everything just to have, you know, that naturally aesthetically pleasing look. And uh, it really does make a difference. We had designed the 8 Series product initially without paying any attention to that and we're like yeah okay it's it's all right you know and then when we went back through it and and golden ratioized it as I would say <laughs> right and you know just kind of move things and we're talking you know 18th of an you know 16th of an inch and you know 0 0.01234 here and there all of those things once they were done it made a huge impact on us visually and we're like wow it does look a lot better <laughs> you know it's like is it a psychological thing it's like no no it definitely you, you definitely key into those kind of things so it's weird it's weird science like that you know that kind of plays into the whole thing that it doesn't really have a you know a, a real basis but that's the way the brain still wants to work where right. it kind of makes sense to us yeah no it's, in, it's, it's interesting like the 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 details of the design aspect and then the reality of manufacturing, like you said, with those edges and having the sharp pieces and like having to having to work around the brushed finish, exactly. <clears throat> you know, plus the, the fact that it does have an impact on you when, when you do all those little details and, and how it appears. Yep. Um, right. Right. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, if you go back to, you know, you, you know, um, to the actual function purpose of the chassis. So A is to, you know, to secure everything in its place, right? Uh, you know, locate it and securely. But so, as well as that, as well as uh, another big factor is then, you know, dealing with uh, heat and airflow, mm -hmm. um, as well as location, as far as any kind of shielding you need between noise sources like a transformer or power supply issues, um, and then. Uh, but the other thing you can't ignore is then both electrical and mechanical um, resonances. Um, and so even though the material of the chassis itself, for instance, you know, we, we, we always use non-ferrous um, chassis material. So we use aluminum uh -huh. because it's non-ferrous, because it's non-magnetic, because in our, you know, more than a few decades now of, of testing, we know that, um, you know, even, even a, a ferrous chassis will affect the sound quality. Right. Even if something as simple as a stamped steel back plate, which is very common because it's easy and it's cheap to do, yep. but and it's easy to paint, but it makes it makes an effect. Yeah, even the screws to that point, right? Even yeah, shout out to one of our customers, John Byrus, I was actually talking to, and one of the things he's done is he's actually pulled all the steel chassis lids and everything off of his cheaper gear that he's had and he said yeah it's made a huge difference in the sound so you know it 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 does all contribute for sure for sure right yes yeah, so if you take all that you know, um uh, to a bit of an extreme you know in our r series gear where where uh the chassis starts out as a billet of aluminum and it's machined out so then some of the advantages that gives us is it, it um it allows us to provide um, excellent shielding between different different modules within the unit. It creates a very 
uh, very stiff chassis. Uh, it also helps the chassis become the heat sink, particularly, yeah. in, in, particularly in the power amplifiers where it becomes one, so you're gonna have to have separate pieces. Um, and, and, that, and that stiffness and or damping uh, has a surprising effect on the sound. <clears throat> right, I mean, just like we found in the MXR with the circuit board material that we talked about yep. in the previous episode yep. where it was flexible and it affected the sound, the way any of those boards are mounted in a chassis and how securely they're held yep. will be affected by, by vibrations for sure. Yep. Yep. Absolutely, and uh, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of funny the challenges we've had over the years, you know, like, you know, when we first started, we were doing, you know, the aluminum face plates and everything, and it's always been aluminum, but we had the aluminum parts and uh, we did a, a lot of the anodized face plates, but we had a powder coated, uh, you know, lid and, you know, back part of the chassis. Uh -huh. And you know, that was the earlier days of powder coating. And uh, Charlie said, had said we had found, you know, some of the, some cases where, you know, where it would be on the coast or whatever, where the salt air would get kind of in there and would actually cause some bubbling underneath of, with, with the powder coating. So you know, he was a big proponent for going to anodized everything, which is definitely not an easy process. And it's very, very unforgiving. So you have to have a machine shop that understands that even a quarter inch scratch on a product is not something that we can accept. So, you know, they have to be in line with it. We have to carefully inspect everything coming in and then we have to figure out how to make raw aluminum look good. So that's where the brushed finishes kind of came into play and Neil Fay and, and Air worked really hard on getting that brush finish right uh, using the scotch pads and everything with the uh, time savers. And uh, it gave it more of a uniform look that we would able to put into our, our chassis pieces. And, you know, that's kind of become the de facto standard in I and audio, I think, in a lot of cases. And uh, then we got to the uh, R series. And with the R series, it, it presented new challenges because you can't stick a block of aluminum underneath a big sander and hope to get all the edges just right. And so how do you treat that? And that's where the diamond cut that we have in those came to be. And, you know, the company worked with Vertec Vertec, <laughs> um, they, uh, they uh, had to basically invent a, a wheel for us to make, put in a huge wheel for us to be able to cut something the size of the VXR, for example, because it was, you know, right. one of the pieces, you know, very, very large. So that was the machine yeah. that no one wanted to stand by when it was operating, right? Exactly. It was kind of the experiment. It's like, okay, this might kill somebody. So nobody be in the room with it. <laughs> right. right. But they were, they, they are... You, you, uh, I'm a, they are they are some what I consider finishing experts. I mean that they are they are probably most well known in the high end audience for doing things like the um, like the um, uh, the Roland uh, chassis finishes, which are very very yep. distinctive. And so they they definitely have experience in that in that machined finish. Um, yeah, they, yeah, they do some beautiful. So they were, it's pretty amazing. Yeah. Absolutely. So yeah, so I mean, we've we've been very fortunate in the partners we've had over the years, and and the problem solving that we can do on both ends to try to figure out the various ways we do things. Um, since then, you know, times have changed. Powder coating all of a sudden is better again, and uh, now they've got better bonding methods with powder coating than they had back in the day. And you know, the the Codex chassis was one of those cases where we were doing the the anodization, and uh, found that actually powder coating the chassis later on ends up providing a better finish than the than the anodize for us so yeah uh, we still do the the anodized faceplate on it but we went to a powder coat chassis so it's kind of a full circle thing where now we're back to where we started and we're doing a little bit of the old stuff but in a new way and uh you know so it's it's always re-examining seeing what new ways things happen you know machines change you know even though the processes are affected the same and it's still metal the things they can do with machines is always getting new and Somebody else has a new exciting idea that we've never heard of before. So we love trying that kind of stuff. And that's the fun part of it, I think. Yeah, for sure. I mean, <clears throat> the look, the, the design, the, how it all fits together. And then the sonic aspects, like you, you mentioned, you know, with, with the R-Series chassis in particular being such a heavy, solid piece of, of billet that gets carved out, um, makes a super cool chassis. And and the, but we, we also have, you know, even with all the care that we do with the chassis, we also have woodblock accessories to set them on. You know, yeah. we've had the question over the years, well, why don't you just make those feet 
the wood blocks instead of putting the regular feet on there. Sure. Um, you know, which has its own durability issues and, and uh, yeah. things, but that's, there are- That's exactly what it comes down to. I mean, when you're looking in different environments with humidity and everything, we tighten our screws down to a certain tightness here in Colorado with our less than 10% humidity in the air. And then yep. it ships to somewhere that's extremely humid the wood swells and then all of a sudden you have cracked feet. So that's right. kind of what it comes down to. <clears throat> right. So we use, we use a, a Delron material and in, in uh, is that, is that in each piece? Is that on the eight series as well now? No, or not the eight series. It's on the five and the seven yeah. or the R series um, yeah. for that, which is the closest sounding material we had to the wood uh, when we did our test. Yeah. Um, yeah so, so the, the, yeah, the plastic feet that we use on the, um, well, I mean, the Delrin's technically a plastic, but the plastic feet that we use in the uh, 8 series is the same that we use in the 7 series. Um, and it's been a very good foot for us. You know, it's nice because it has the felt pad underneath and they kind of grip and, uh -huh. and you know, they, they, they sound decent. Um, the, it's kind of, a, kind of a funny story was when we went to the X5 series, we found a larger foot of the exact same version as the exact same company made a larger plastic foot than uh, what we had been using in the AX7 and the CX7 and the K5. And uh, so we put them on there and not really thinking too much about it and uh, did our listening test, designed the circuit, had a great sounding preamplifier, had an amazing sounding integrated amplifier and uh, you know, really, really enjoyed them. And uh, we shipped them over to um, our partners in Japan with access and they listened to them and they said they don't sound very good and Charlie and I were both scratching our head because we know that that they're almost always right you know if not always right, right. you know anytime that they have an opinion about a, a piece they're pretty dead on and even when we don't agree we usually find out what they were hearing and then we're like oh okay yeah and this was no exception you know we we, we took the system back into the room we put it down onto the wood blocks like we always do. And we listen to it and we're like, they must be crazy. These, these things sound great. I don't, I don't hear what they're hearing at all. And it took us about two or three days listening. And then I still try to go, let's try taking the feet out, the, the wood blocks out and let's put them on their feet. And we did that and instantly, it was exactly what they were describing. We're like, oh, these are terrible. So we had to had to remove the feet from all of these units and put Delrin underneath them to to get that that sound quality right. that we that we were expecting and you know then once that was done they were they were right where they were supposed to be but it's it's such it's always it's the, the devil's in the details and chassis are definitely a great example of where that is you know you put in a screw dead center in the middle of a CX7 at the top to hold down the lid and then you find out that if the bend is ever so slightly off, you see like gall wing bowing that goes across the lid and it doesn't work at all. So now you have to rethink about how you're shimming things and techs are spending hours upon hours getting things just right to make sure everything fits and looks clean. And it's, it's, always, it's always a different story with each one. And so, you know, we've learned lessons every time we've done one and, you know, they're better and better. And I think the eight series has been a really cool case of how things fit together you know we have a really universal chassis that works with multiple products and the universal lid and then you know you change out your face plates and your rear panels and off you go and everything really kind of fits seamlessly and uh <laughs> we uh we we did things like oh well nobody wants to see the screws in the top so we got rid of the screws in the top then we hear oh well we actually like the screws in the top so <laughs> there's always it's always different opinions and you never can please everyone but I'm, pre I'm pretty proud of what we do from the chassis aspect and yeah. I think our looks are pretty cool and you know I, I know that we don't cheap out on anything so you know we take pretty good pride in that. Yeah no it's great and it's a great story about the uh, you know us listening to them on the wood blocks. Yep and yeah, that's our access, standard. Right and access listening on the regular feet right like right. That's, yeah. Yeah. that's our standard procedure. Yeah. Listening so but that you know there's all kinds of pictures and things that we've been sent over the years in customers' rooms where they have pieces on top of the chassis, different feet under the chassis, different, yep. you know, racks uh, that yep. everything's sitting on, shelves. So it comes into that that uh, piece where every little detail makes a difference. Right? In fact, so, I remember being so annoyed at how, those, how much of a difference those wood blocks made. That was when we 
change to just including a set of wood blocks with every unit yep. because we're like, well, if they sound <clears throat> perfect that way, then they just need to have that with them. So right. we can hear them. So you know, it's not it's not about making money on an accessory for us. It's about providing the best audio experience for everyone. So that's yeah, that's what we do. Absolutely. But you know, my point is that at some point the chassis becomes part of the system and part of the room. You know, Absolutely. Because you've got you know different reflections, different vibrations in every room. So while there are tons of tweaks, I know we'll get a bunch of emails off of this video of why don't you do this or why don't you do that or why don't you include this because you know they're all viable options. There's lots of great tweaks out there to go on a chassis lid or to go underneath the product or the rack to put it on. But at some point it all becomes part of the system in the room and it all interacts and there isn't one right answer for every one of those situations. Um, which, you know, is another great part of this hobby and, and industry of, of, you know, infinite tweaking. Well, it's not only that, but it's also, you know, when we do a lot of our listening tests here, we want to emulate how we know it can be in another person's room. So, you know, the last thing we want to do, and I re have respect for every audio company out there that does their own, you know, their own tweaks and everything that makes the sound better, especially the ones that, you know, people can definitely hear the difference, but the uh, the reality is, is, you know, we can't always expect somebody to have this accessory, nor do we want to get into the habit of endorsing one brand over somebody else's or anything like that. So, you know, for us, we, we obviously treat our room to the point of making sure that there's no reflections and, uh, you know, the getting rid of echoes and things like that and uh, and making the room, you know, acoustically good. But, you know, as you know, Brent, that you and Charlie went around and picked up a bunch of mats to hang on the wall to, oh, yeah. to make that happen in, in a lot of cases. So it wasn't any specialty high-end audio gear or specialty, you know, uh, room treatment pr um, products that we bought. It was just off-the-shelf stuff. And uh, similarly, you know, it's, it's dangerous to get into these, okay, we're listening to everything with this particular isolator from this company and all of our sound gear is now tweaked to that to sound the best with that. So we, we try to start from what I would call ground zero, which is just the air product on, you know, a nice shelf, you know, we have an HRS shelf here and they're very nice shelves, but um, beyond that, um, you know, it's, it's the wood blocks. Again, when you buy an air product nowadays, you get the wood blocks that come with it. So you can emulate exactly what we do here in the listening room. And we know then you're at least starting out from the same point we started at when you start setting up your, your system. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So yeah, chassis, <clears throat> they're, uh, there's more to them than meets the eye. Uh, yeah. it's, uh, it's, they can be difficult to design. There's lots of details in there. Everything you do affects the sound. Uh, so it's something we have to pay a lot of attention to and spend well, I was actually surprised when I first started it there how much time went into the chassis part of a product. Yeah, it's probably one of the more expensive single components in, in the gear too. You know, you you look right. at things like, you know, transform. I mean, when you have a circuit board completely assembled, yeah, it's absolutely expensive, but you can break that down into smaller components. If you're talking just a raw piece like that faceplate, you know, is they're not cheap, you know, and so you have to get them right. And things like the thickness of the material makes a difference and right. the you know dimensions makes a difference all of a sudden you get this resonance when you have a dimension of some type and then if you take an inch off in one direction the resonance goes away so <laughs> all these things play huge factors and and it's it's a lot of back and forth with the machine shops and you send out things they send back to you and it's not quite right so you have to do it all over again and yeah it's it's, yeah. it's that and maybe remote controls are probably two of the biggest <laughs> processes. You have to do an another episode just on remote controls. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it's, it's funny how much time those things take. And it's not even the, the audio, you know, the heart of the audio like people would think, but it's still something that makes a difference. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. yeah I mean, it is it's still, and it is still, and it's still part of the electrical circuit as well. I mean, the yep. chassis is, I mean, it, it is. Right. It is you at some point should be connected to at least the signal ground, mm -hmm. um, you know, of, you know, the, the power supply and the circuits. And so, you know, it, you, you can't even overlook that part of it as far as like, like how that's connected and where it's connected mm -hmm. um, and, and its function in, in actually shielding 
the actual audio circuitry. Right. <clears throat> right. Yeah. That's, that's a major, major factor. Yep. Yeah. Cool. Well, we hope you guys have a new appreciation for chassis and, and chassis design. And uh, if you have thoughts on it, thoughts on, uh, you know, our chassis, tweaks that you've done to your chassis that made a huge difference, email us, pints at air.com. Until next time, cheers. Cheers. Thank <laughs> you.